Hi, everyone. Welcome to Navigating the Complexities of Race, Racial Healing and Reconciliation. My name is Renee Edwards, and I'm the Program Director for Fairfax County Public Library. During this presentation, please keep your videos off and your audio muted. Use the chat box for any questions or comments. This program will be recorded and available on the library's website. Recently, we have had some Zoom bombing incidents. If that happens today, we will have to end the presentation. Please allow me to introduce our presenter, Dr. Maureen Walker. Dr. Walker is a licensed psychologist with an independent practice in psychotherapy and multicultural consultation in Cambridge, Massachusetts. For 25 years, Dr. Walker worked at Harvard Business School, providing counseling and mental health support to students in the graduate management program. After retiring from her role as the Director of Student Support Services, she has maintained her affiliation with Harvard Business School through clinical consultation services. Her current projects include developing a practice model for confronting the claims of post-racialism and promoting justice in the context of inequitable power arrangements. In addition, she is the author of When Getting Along Is Not Enough, Reconstructing Race in Our Lives and Relationships. Welcome and thank you, Dr. Walker. Thank you. I am so very happy uh, to be with you. Uh, literally everyone, when Renee and I first started talking about this gathering, uh, we had imagined that we'd all be in a room together, but obviously we can't do that. Uh, we can't be together in that way, but I'm certainly grateful that we have an opportunity to be together as we are today. So. Our focus, so just jump right in. Our focus today is uh, navigating the complexities of race, um, helping us to think a little bit about how we go about healing and reconciling some of the divisiveness that we are living. And actually, when I think about the word complexities, it's a little bit of a euphemism, because if we are really, you know, if we, pay, if we just pay attention to the last 48 hours or so, and we look out in the world, we, we might be reminded of that saying like, you know, going to hell in a handbasket. And I'm sure there have been times when we uh, would, you know, look at something and go, well, where are we going and how did we get here? And that's what I'm hoping we're going to do today. We're gonna to talk a little bit about um, how we got to this place that we're in right now and how it feels, what happens to us here, and most important, how can we get out of it? Um, today, you are going to hear me talk a lot about something that I call disruptive empathy. And um, I, when I wrote When Getting Along is not, is not Enough, I put a lot of emphasis on this. And so we'll talk a little bit more about how we can expand our capacity for disruptive empathy. We'll talk about what some of the barriers are to practicing it, what keeps us from practicing empathy in this way, and maybe share some responses. I hope we'll share responses and learn from each other uh, about um, things that we might do to create new possibilities in uh, relationship. So um, let me get started by telling you two stories actually about how I came to write this book. And when I tell these stories, I want to invite you to think along with me. And I want you to think about the experiences or some experiences that you have had in which um, your first ideas, I think about race and what it means to be a racialized body, how that first came, um, became apparent to you. So my first story about ideas and how I first got an idea about what this meant. As a black woman, I grew up in the racial apartheid culture of Augusta, Georgia in the 1950s and the 1960s. And racial awareness was something that dawned on me early in my childhood. And of course, as some of you might expect, some of this starts with a bus. Uh, I would regularly go uh, with my great grandmother when she'd go shopping in downtown Augusta, Georgia. And I remember being very young, maybe 
it could have been one of my first trips, but I was really very excited. Maybe I was about four years old or so. And um, she was standing in the front, putting her money in. And I pushed past her and I just plopped down on the first seat, you know, just thinking, I guess, with delight about what we were going to experience when we got to Broad Street or, or where all the stores were. And the next thing I remember was being sort of snatched out of that reverie by my great grandmother and pulled to the back of the bus. And as I was being pulled, I could hear someone and actually, the only people on the bus at that time of day were black women. Uh, but I could hear one of them sort of laugh and said, you know, that, that child doesn't know that's where white folks sit. Now, as a four-year-old, I really didn't know what they meant by white folk. It, I, I just knew that I wasn't one. And I knew that not being one meant that something was not quite right with me, that something was... Um, something was something was wrong about the and that everybody knew about it except me now if you're growing up in a racial apartheid culture one thing i can say for sure is that they don't leave anything to chance uh you get taught how you're supposed to do your race very very early on and that was the first time i realized that being white meant something and i was not white and that meant something else it was also the first time i felt rather stupid now i felt that way you know, many times since then. But this is something that I figured that everybody knew except me, and I was supposed to know it. I was supposed to know that I was an inferior being. I was supposed to learn that right along with learning my ABCs and how to tie my shoes. So that's how some of my, some of my first ideas, how, how I was first introduced to the practice of doing race. I have to fast forward now three or four decades. This is January 2017, and I'm sitting with my husband in a restaurant at the bar eating something, deviled eggs or whatever, it doesn't matter. But what happened is I looked up and there was a parade in Florida at Mar-a-Lago, and there was a woman standing out there and she had on her yoga pants and her MAGA cap and she had a big sign, you know, we love, you know, the president and uh you know cheering him on you know the the pain that i was feeling the post election pain was very raw for me still and as i looked up and saw her i immediately i will not tell you what i called her but let's just say i in, a, in less than 5 seconds in my i called her uh let's just say an organic lump uh and I caught myself, it's like, wait a minute, here I am, I call myself a relational cultural therapist. I have spent so much of my professional life writing about racial healing. I have worked in the Catholic Church with anti-racism ministries and I'm going, how could I do that? I don't know that woman unless, if I looked at her longer, I probably would have called her other names. But in just that few seconds, I had totally reduced her to nothing. So I had to confront things in myself, like, okay, what is happening with me? How did I fall so quickly into that moral breach that I, um, I try to write about, I try to live with, uh, in a different way? How did that happen? Now, I think it's important for us to take stock of these kinds of moments in our lives, because I kind of don't think I'm the only one who has or who have had those moments when we have to say, wait, how did this happen? I am not acting in accord with what I say I believe. What is happening and what, what kind of story about race is being triggered for me in this moment? So it became really important for me then to say, okay, what is it we need to do? And so I started writing about it. And there were three things that were standing out for me. We have, to, we have to take stock of ourselves because most of us are not bad people. Most of us really do want to get along in the world. And we are here today, most of us, because we are heart sick and we are appalled by what we are seeing happening in our culture right now. And this is, you know, there's all kinds of racial violence going on. It's going on at all levels. It's not just, you know, what, we, what looks like the conflagration. And 
the other reason that I thought, okay, I really have to really dig into this because we are so good at getting along that most of us might think, yeah, you know, that's good enough. And uh, actually, we're probably just skimming the very, very surface of our potential if we become comfortable with just getting along. And we don't really fully become an, um, who we can be with each other. Um, I also thought a little bit about the times, and I invite you to think about in your life, the relationships you have, people that you call really good friends, but there are just some conversations about race you will not have with them. I think most of us have those situations in our lives, and that's why I wrote the book, and that's why I started thinking about so much about how might we do empathy differently. Now, before I do that, though, let's, let's talk a little bit about how things got this way. How did we get to this place that we are in this nation where everything is racialized? Racial meaning tends to be infused in almost everything we do. None of us would ever have believed that wearing a mask could take on racialized meaning, but it often does. So um, how did we get here? I think the first thing that we have to, you know, um, be honest about is that we do notice groupness. I know that uh, some of us like to say, oh, I just see people and I'm colorblind. Well, no, well, some people are, but not when it comes to race. We do notice groupness and it seems to be a part of our human um, makeup that in-group bias is just a central aspect of human behavior. I'm sure there is some evolutionary value to that. It was really important to know uh, who's like us and who may not be like us. Um, what should I be afraid of? That could have, that could really be sort of a, a life or death decision that we've had to make as we've come through this evolutionary cycle. Uh, the second is that we are in the United States. And in the United States, race became an organizing construct to mitigate uh, class uh, identification and ethnic identification. And what was very, very clear is that the way to gain access to resources and maybe stave off, not maybe, but certainly to stave off threats of violence uh, was to become white. Uh, so uh, we have this polarity that got set up in, well, in, in the 17th century. Uh, there's a lot of, you know, I was trying to think just right off the top of my head um, uh, of, of some, I, I think, books that I think are really good in talking about that. But let's, uh, but Higginbotham has a lot of good uh, work out on that, tracing what happened in the different state legislators uh, so that um, there was this sharp distinction made between uh, being white and superior and black and inferior. White indentured European servants were uh, had limited terms of uh, servitude, and they may have gotten. Uh, I, I think some of the um, legislation that I've seen from Virginia in the 17th century stipulated that they may get may get maybe acreage and corn and all of that as a way to uh, for them to get started after serving out their period of servitude. On the other hand, Africans were chattel slaves for life. And to make sure that those distinctions made clear, there was all sorts of, um, there were sanctions uh, to stop people from connecting across, across um, what was then organized as race. The third thing that I think this has been, that's really important for us to pay attention to is that successive generations of immigrants uh, and people who are native to the country and people who were trafficked to the United States, irrespective of how they look. All of us get socialized into racial identity systems and these systems are based on that black white polarity. Other people come in and have to figure out how do I fit within the continuum. Uh, some of the richest experiences I've had uh, was, been, was um, to work with my husband uh, with the uh, Irish Immigration Center in Boston. And one of the things in a lot of the conversations that we would have, they would talk about the rapidity with which they began to be socialized to lose the Irishness in order to become white. Um, there is, I also was reading something uh, last, 
quite recently, probably over the weekend, uh, I was reminded of the Supreme Court case in, 19, in the 1920s where a Japanese person actually petitioned to become white uh, simply by his skin color. He said he was whiter than many white people. And the Supreme Court decided, I believe in 1922, 23, that no, he could not be white, that that would be a designation that would be um, uh, reserved for people from the Caucasus Mountains. Of course, not that many people from the Caucasus Mountains were actually in the United States at the time, but I simply raised that uh, example to say that it was a status to be achieved and people had to figure out how to fit themselves within uh, that, that uh, type of stratification. Um, so when we ask ourselves, when other people ask us, who do you think you are? Um, race is one of the ways that we make meaning of our lives. And it is deeply implicated in the way we see ourselves and the way we see other people and what we think we deserve. And the beliefs and the meaning systems that we have around race are, can be anything from non-conscious and implicit to certainly really, really hyper-conscious and explicit. I want to share something that I read quite recently. This is from Isabel, um, Isabel Wilkerson, the woman who wrote The Warmth of Other Sons. And in talking about race, she said um, that it's a visible public cue. It is a historic flashcard um, of how people are expected to be, are to be treated, where they're expected to live, what kinds of positions they are expected to hold, whether they belong in this section of town or that seat in the boardroom, uh, whether they should be expected to speak with authority on any subject, whether they will be administered pain relief in the hospital, whether they will be more or less likely to survive childbirth in the most advanced nation in the world, or whether or not they may be shot with impunity by authorities. Now, um, and I read that because I want to say that race is something that we learn to do. As we became more and more sophisticated through the 90s, you know, and, and, and in the early 2000s, most of us learned to say, oh, you know, race is a biological fiction. Yes, it is. It's, it's a social construct. Because it is a social construct, it does not mean that it isn't real and doesn't have real political consequences. Um, and that we don't learn very early how to do race, even if we don't know very much about how to talk about it. And I also realize that this is a kind of a hard notion for, for many people to accept. But it's the setup that we walk into when we are citizens in this country. And this is the setup. The setup is that physiologically, we are made to be in connection with each other. We get to know who we are as human beings through our relationships with other people. That is how we grow. So we are made physiologically, neurologically wired for connection, but our society creates, normalizes, and actually rewards racial disconnection. And that is one of the, that is how our capacity for empathy gets inhibited. We get trained out of our capacity for, him, for empathy. Uh, one of the things that um, people, you know, if people, there, there's so many uh, studies now that talk about how as babies, babies uh, learn to respond to each other empathically. We've learned so much more about brains than we used to know. Uh, and the, we used to say that they didn't, you know, they, they didn't know how to be empathetic, but we have, you know, lots of studies now that say, you know, from the very beginning, we respond to each other in nonverbal ways empathically. But when we live in a society that says you get treated this way and you get treated there, you belong here, not there. Uh, you may speak, but no one really has to take you seriously, or maybe you don't get to speak at all. Um, maybe you don't even get to have potable drinking water. You know, we can see how racialized connection is normalized so that growing up and living with it is sort of easy to not even think about it. It's just sort of how things get done, how we behave. And one of the, you know, I would invite you to think about um, how you might reflexively sometimes behave without even thinking about what's, you know, why you might be behaving. When do you avert your eyes rather than meet someone and greet them? Um, 
face on. Now, I'm not saying that race is the only way we, we are divided. I'm simply saying that in this culture, it is a linchpin stratifier, and it is how Americanness, it is a quintessential power tool of disconnection in our culture. So what are we gonna do about it? Because that's the that's what we're really here for today is to talk about, so what do we do with all of this? Uh, we try to do empathy uh, and, and we try to do it because for the most part, again, we're really pretty good at just um, at getting along. Most of us can keep our jobs. Most of us can go to a neighborhood barbecue and not get thrown out. Most of us manage to have, you know, reasonable sets of uh, colleagues and acquaintances and get along with each other. But again, for the most part, the way we think about empathy, the way we practice empathy can really get um, inhibited. We are sort of left uh, knowing how to do easy empathy. And I sometimes call it the thoughts and prayers kind of empathy. And easy empathy can ring really, really hollow because typically it is. I, I just want you to think for a minute about the past few weeks, about all of the messenger, messages of condolences that you have, you know, you've probably seen popping up everywhere. I logged into my bank account yesterday and uh, one of the first messages that came up when I logged in was uh, to all of our black customers. And I'm going, why, why do you need to ask me? You know, what, what is that? Uh, why, well, why do you need to have a message for me? This is a message to Americans. In any case, when we get those messages like that, we can just delete them and move on. Um, but sometimes, you know, easy empathy can also get really, really awkward. Uh, I have spoken with many people over, you know, like well-intentioned people who are saying, I don't know what to do. Like in uh, the aftermath of Mr. Floyd's murder, in uh, the aftermath of Breonna Taylor's murder, and all of that we've seen over the last years, all of the violence that happens, uh, people have said, well, I, I'd like to do something, and I don't know what to do, and you know, most of it is is um, is motivated, I'd say, by really, really good intentions. Uh, and, and let me give an example. I have received text messages from people whom I barely know or rarely interact with, who are checking on me and who checked on me to ask me how I was doing um, uh, in the immediate aftermath of 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 the black of of. Uh, of the murder of, of Mr. Floyd, of, of the number of protests and uprisings that were in the street. And I was thinking, well, if someone that I, you know, I, I actually checked one text message and I realized that the last time I had received a text uh, from this person was like October 11th, 2015. And out of really good intentions, she was saying to me, well, I'd like to send you love, how are you doing? And what is the answer to that? It makes us all really kind of awkward. I say, well, you know, given 400 years of systemic oppression and racial violence and violations that affect every aspect of my being and functioning, I guess I'm doing well. But that's not what people are looking for and it's not what we want to do when we are trying to figure out how do we get past this awkwardness that we have um, with each other. So that's why I started thinking about a few years ago, this notion of disruptive empathy. This is the kind of empathy, the kind of I feel your pain empathy that most of us would like to do. Uh, and we try to do that most of the time. Uh, but I think where we are now, and certainly by what we're living, just judging from what we are living, we know that we need something more. Uh, we like to say, uh, when we're talking about empathy, we like to say things like, oh, it's really important to walk a mile in somebody else's shoes. So one of the things that I would say that I want us to think about when we think about disruptive empathy or empathy of any kind is you can't walk a mile in somebody else's shoes if you have your own, tight, your own shoes tightly laced up. So when we talk about, I use those two words together, disruption and empathy, quite purposefully, because the kind of empathy that we are needing to practice, that we need to learn now, uh, is empathy that does require us to move out of our comfort zones quite often 
it does require some level of dislocation from what we feel comfortable doing. It does disrupt many times our sense of who we are in the world. And disruptive empathy is, I'd say, different from the sort of easy thoughts and prayers empathy because it enables us to acknowledge really hard truths. And this is, you know, we think of empathy oftentimes as being warm and fuzzy, uh, but um, this is empathy that is not sugar-coated in any way. Disruptive empathy also allows us to live with our own contradictions. So as a person who reads and uh, who reads, writes, teaches, tries to live, uh, who lives actually in, in a mixed race family, for me to say, sit at a bar and within five seconds call a woman whom I did not know, a name that she really did not deserve, as I stopped to think about it, this woman could work in a nursing home and she could be the woman who gives my mother a bath. She's more than what I see. So how did I immediately just categorize her as something less than human? So disruptive empathy allows us to stop, stand still and confront ourselves and just take in the contradictions. Most of us have this sense of ourselves, this model version of ourselves that we want other people to see. But we also have the blind spots. We have a version of ourselves, we say, oh, I'm not like that. And I, what I am suggesting is that when it comes to how we have all been racial, uh, racialized in this country, we've all been uh, socialized into racial stratification, most of us carry lots of contradictions, not always on a conscious level, uh, but we carry contradictions. And sometimes we don't feel those contradictions until we get caught off guard. Disruptive empathy in that sense teaches us how to be more, it teaches us humility. Uh, and it almost always requires us to take off our own shoes before we start to talk about connecting across some kind of a racialized difference or connecting with people within our own group on uh, subjects on issues that are racialized. So uh, let me talk about how we do it. And I think what is, you know, it's um, what comprises what I've called uh, disruptive empathy. But before we do that, again, I want to invite you to think for a minute about um, a conversation about race that maybe you have avoided. It could be with a colleague, a family member, uh, a friend. It could be with a client, uh, someone you supervise, uh, someone who supervises you, uh, but a conversation that's been avoided. And maybe it's been avoided because you just sort of skim the surface and say, oh yes, we need to just get along. Or it maybe it gets uh, avoided by deflection, you know, like, derailing the conversation and talking about something else or sometimes you know we avoid those conversations just by you know running away uh but i i want to share as i share these ideas i'd like to invite you to think about how they may resonate with your experience and also if any part of it might be helpful to us in our project of learning to navigate the complexities the conflagration the hostilities uh, and the suspicions and fears that we often carry, sometimes like a low-grade fever. So I talk about disruptive empathy as what I call the arc of empathy. And the first part of that is awareness. We have to learn to attune to the present moment and to really be present in the here and now. Now, that's important because so much of what we know about race so much of what we've been taught about race has been taught through mixed messages and sometimes not even verbally, or it came in at a very, very early age. People may have been saying one thing in our home, but we actually saw how we lived in another way. So some of the memories are implicit memories. They're memories that aren't uh, immediately available to us. We don't just walk around always consciously thinking what we believe about race. Now, the thing about implicit memory that's tricky is that it comes up really fast. It comes up so fast that it appears to be true. You just think, okay, that's just me, or that's just the way I am. 
implicit memories are not a part of our thinking brain. And so we might find ourselves um, getting triggered or we might, find some, we might find ourselves maybe sometimes having a really intense reaction to something and wondering why. Like, you know, why was I so bothered by that? Why did that person make me so angry? And, or we might find ourselves behaving in ways as I did um, or saying things that really, we don't want that to be a part of our moral code. So when those moments happen, oftentimes it's because something has been triggered, some old message has been brought up and we're responding immediately to that. The way that we can help ourselves is to slow ourselves down, to take a pause and to try to be present to what's going on. One of the things that I had to do was move beyond the image on that television screen when I saw the woman waving her big sign and with her MAGA cap on and say, I don't know who this is. I don't know the rest of her life. This could be someone who will pull off her, pull off her shoes to give them to me if I needed them. So I can't, it's not right. I can have my opinions about her political um, inclinations and her political uh, affiliations, but I cannot say that she's somehow less human than I am. That makes me no different from the people that I say I, we, the, the, I'm doing what I'm saying that we actually need to try to heal. Um, some people find themselves in that moment, say when somebody cuts them off in traffic. I don't know. Uh, but I'd like you to think about what happens when you find yourself in a breach of some sort and how do you pull yourself back to awareness? Because that's very, very important. Um, the other part, the second part, is respect, receptivity, you know, being open to learning something new in a relationship. If you are, and you know, this is like true confession, there are some people I don't, I, I can't imagine learning from, and I, I'm afraid to learn from them. I'm afraid, you know, oh my God, if I take on those, you know, on uh, that person's characteristics, but really, if we just think about it, can we be in another person's presence and just be curious and say, well, who else is, what else can I learn about this person? What else can I invite into the conversation? Rather than suppressing difference, how might we bring it respectfully into the conversation? Actually, I think respect is at the root of any kind of empathy. That without respect, we default or we go into something uh, that is, um, much less dignifying of another person's humanity. So uh, respect, receptivity, that's all about an invitation to bring in our own contradictions and um, the contradictions that other people may have too in the relationship. It's important too, because if we're doing easy empathy, a thoughts and prayers empathy, that is highly conditional. When we're doing that kind of empathy, we're saying, oh, um, if I like you, I can show you empathy. If you're behaving the way I think you should behave, if you're being respectable enough uh, with your complaints, uh, then maybe I can listen to you and try and understand what's going on for, from your point of view. If I feel sorry for you, then maybe I'll try to understand. Or if you remind me of myself. Well, the kind of empathy that I'm talking about is not conditional. It is an invitation to otherness, difference, contradiction, and curiosity. It does not require another person to fit into our imagination of who they should be. Uh, I'm sh sure some of you have probably been in situations, uh, you, you can probably recall instances, but I remember um, being in a conference room when a young man on one of the Harvard campuses, had a young African-American male had been stopped by security. And when, when he was trying to go into his dorm um, around midnight one night. Now we have to remember that some people have been killed just trying to go home, but he was stopped by security. And the, the, the pre presumptive reason was he looked like he fit the description of somebody who had committed a robbery somewhere else. Of course, he was angry. And so he went through all the proper channels and he talked to all of the people about it. And I think people did show him, oh yes, oh yes, you know, that's so bad, we're so sorry, we're gonna to talk to him about that. And uh, 
But the thing that struck me as I was sitting in the room, there was so much more conversation was, well, was he talking angry when he talked to you? I mean, he's, his anger is not going to do him any good. So it was sort of like saying, we can only be compassionate with this person if he behaves the way we think a victim should behave. So respect moves us away from that kind of empathy. And the last I would notice, I would uh, mention is compassion. Empathy doesn't necessarily feel good or comfortable. Compassion is not about making somebody else feel good, but it is about safety. It is making sure that we hold and create safe places in our relationships so that we can hold constructive uncertainty. We don't have to know everything. We might uh, even um, get a glimpse of our shared humanity. The other thing about empathy uh, is that this may be exactly what is needed to get us to go through the kind of conflict, growth fostering conflict that we need to uh, experience in order to go forward. Uh, a lot of us get a little uh, queasy with the word conflict, but all conflict has to be is a confrontation of differences. It doesn't mean conquest, it doesn't mean combat. It means bringing our differences together so that we can grow. And frankly, that's how everybody grows. Human beings do not grow by interacting with mirror images of themselves. We grow through constructive conflict. So um, disruptive empathy, I think what it absolutely does for us, it puts us in a place where we can have those conflicts. And I want to say about compassion, there's nothing, nothing at all that is weak need about it. It's a profound act of courage to actually allow ourselves to see some shared bit of humanity with someone who may otherwise be the exact opposite of who we think we are. And again, as I said, it's not at all about feeling comfortable, but it is about being safe, making sure that we keep our relational spaces safe so that we can bring our differences together. If you'll think about maybe a challenging conversation you may have had, one that really worked out well, it was probably because you were willing to go through conflict respectfully rather than sweeping stuff under the rug. We can't always walk around on lumpy rugs because we have so much stuff under them. What happens when we avoid conflict is that we create dead zones in relationships. And there are these places in relationships where you just can't go. Um, what happens with good conflict is that it enlivens and it, it, it animates the space uh, so that we can learn and grow with each other, which is what we were actually put here to do. It opens us up to new possibilities in relationship. And if this feels hard, I, I will just say it's normal because it's not how we typically navigate our spaces. Most of us navigate our racialized spaces, and most spaces are racialized, whether it's the grocery store or bird watching or relationships with people we love. Um, we navigate those spaces often by just learning to get along. And in this culture that actually normalizes disconnection and in many ways rewards disconnection, there are a lot of barriers to empathy. There are a lot, but I'm only gonna mention three because I really hope we will have some time to do some conversation. Uh, the first is just our brains. You know, we have uh, selective perception. We get trained, we get our neural pathways are trained in ways that uh, we may, as Janet Helms, um, who's a, 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 a critical race theorist and researcher, said that it was, it's actually possible for a Black person and a white person to walk into a movie theater at the same time and walk out having seen very different movies. So, and a lot of that is how our brains have been trained. We don't have to worry about that because now we also know that we can retrain our brains uh, just takes practice to do that. Um, the other is that we have these loyalties to our narratives about ourselves. We have preferred images of ourselves, uh, preferred narratives. We say, oh, this is who I am. You know, idealized. I'm the person who really has done and wants to do all this work on uh, anti-racism and um, helping people heal and, 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 and racial reconciliation. 
And the disowned self is the one who sat in a restaurant and within five seconds called somebody I didn't know a really ugly name. And, but if we get so tied to this image, oh, I'm not, I'm not a person who would ever do that. If we don't accept those disowned parts of ourselves, we never really get to experience empathy with other people. We also have preferred narratives about other people. Sometimes the stereotypes, and I, and I say positive in quotations, because I, I don't know that there is any such thing as a positive stereotype, because it limits people to our imagination um, and to our um, uh, subconscious beliefs. So the loyalty to narratives sometimes keep us out of um, this practice, keep us away from this practice of disruptive empathy. And the last thing I would say is just tribal loyalty. Sometimes when we bridge a racial divide, sometimes when we cultivate um, authentic connections around issues of race, and believe me, it can be just as difficult to do within our own racial groups, we are afraid of, um, of getting kicked out, really, that we might lose credibility if we say something that people like us don't agree with or don't expect from us. So these tribal loyalties sometimes will keep us uh, from, from actually practicing empathy that helps us heal in the way that we need to. There was some really wonderful research that was done uh, late 90s and the early 2000s about cross-racial helping. And uh, what the research showed repeatedly uh, was that we are more likely to help each other. We are more likely to help someone who is racially different from us if members of our own racial group are not watching. That is something that should give us pause. I don't know that much has been done since you know the you know 2010 or something, but that's what the research was showing back then. And if I just think anecdotally about experiences that I have had, that I've witnessed, that I've talked with so many people about over uh, the years, tribal loyalty is something that holds us, that inhibits us when we really want to do more and be more. So. What are we gonna do? There are five things we can do right now. When we find ourselves in these situations, the first thing we need to do is just breathe. If we're not breathing, nothing else is gonna happen anyway. So uh, we need to allow ourselves to be, to take that pause, to put ourselves in a more relaxed body state. And we do that by first of all noticing, what are we feeling physically? You know, where is this, you know, if I'm, experiencing some eruption of road rage, where do I feel that in my body? What am I thinking? What kind of story is getting triggered? Am I telling myself some story about white entitlement, say if I get cut off in traffic? Or uh, what am I feeling? Am I feeling um, victimized? Am I feeling angry uh, or angry fear? But to notice really, what are we feeling? Because Oftentimes we respond so quickly, we don't even know that we, what we're responding to. We're responding out of our fear centers, typically. So allowing ourselves to breathe, which is difficult in this culture because we like to do things fast, but allowing ourselves to breathe, even if it means coming back to a conversation on another day, to take a pause and then act from the pause. It's one of the first things we need to do. The second is that we need to lighten up on our own expectations. You know, sometimes we give ourselves um, a hard time because we say, well, I don't, I, I might say the wrong thing. It is absolutely normal to feel stupefied, really, to have a loss of words um, in the face of racialized conflict. My husband and I often talk about um, uh, how we wish we were like our children, our, our, who are very, very quick with it. So we will find ourselves in a situation and, you know, three or four days later, we're going, I could have said, I should have said, I would have said, you know, and wow, if, uh, if Angela were here, or Walker were here, they would have said something really different. It would have been fast. But those are ways that we keep ourselves from practicing empathy because the first thing we're doing is not being empathic with ourselves. So we need to lighten up on our expectations to have the right response. And also on this fear that sometimes restricts and constricts our movement. So often people say, I don't, I don't want to reach out because I might say the wrong thing and then someone might call me 
a racist and I'm so afraid of what someone else might say, I might make the wrong impression that I do nothing. Um, the third thing, become curious. When we find ourselves in a situation uh, and we need to go into some kind of conversation that uh, feels intense or challenging, become curious about the other person. Try to see what else there is because we all have images of other people that come really quick, it's really automatic. What's behind the face? And try to make a space in the relationship so that you have time to see what's behind the face. Uh, to get the rest of the story rather than trying to make someone else fit into our imagination of who they are in the world. Offer to engage in sharing differences. In other words, we're inviting good conflict because when we invite it, we can, in, we can widen the portal to increase safety and presence so that we can be with each other. I'm imagining that most of us can think of conversations we have had with people that we thought, wow, I did not want to go there, but we were able to do it in a way that the relationship became even more authentic and more intimate, deeper in many ways. And we got to experience more about, of our own possibility and more of the other person's possibility. And the last thing I will say uh, is that whatever we do, we need to have a community. We need a community of differentiated allies. In other words, we need to have an intentional community. The people who just show up in our front door, backyard, at the kitchen table, may not, may, those are people we're comfortable with. But perhaps if we want to learn to heal and to grow from this, you know, full hundred year history that has affected all of us, none of us has gone unscathed by this history that we were handed and born into, we need other people, people who are like us, different from us, but differentiated allies, people who know that we may not be on the very same journey, but we are on a shared journey as human beings. We want to get to that place uh, where we get to feel the connections and grow in the kinds of connections um, that make us more whole. Um, I I'd like to close uh, with something that I saw um, again from Isabel uh, Wilkerson. And I think it's, it was a, a really beautiful sentence. She said that any of us manages to create abiding connections across these manufactured historic and cultural differences is a testament to the beauty of the human spirit. So I want to stop and invite Renee in and say, help us. <laughs> Hi, so if you have questions for Dr. Walker, please put, post those in the chat. And I, I do have several questions. I was taking notes as you presented. Um, and one of my questions is you talked about easy empathy. And I thought about George Floyd and how everybody basically witnessed his murder on camera. And it seemed like the marches that happened as a result of that were different. Like, like it was more white people. It became almost like this worldwide Absolutely. protest against racial injustice. Would you define that as easy empathy? Not at all. <laughs> I don't think that was easy uh, at all. And uh, one of the things that I think uh, what, what we witnessed when we saw the protest, we have to go back to our history that most of us, we have to look for it to learn it, but white people have always been involved in the fight for racial justice. It wasn't just Viola Liuzzo uh, uh, and uh, Schwerner and Goodman. White people have always been involved. In fact, um, uh, I, over 50% of the people who went to the free, on the Freedom Summer bus rides, over 50% were white. There were white nuns disobeying their bishops and saying, yeah, we're gonna be involved. One of the ways though that racism and racial division uh, gets perpetuated and stoked in this culture is that we don't get to see, uh, we don't have as much exposure to the history of anti-racism, 
of people working together. Now, what I will call easy empathy, if I can give an example of what I think easy empathy is, um, lift every voice and sing has always been a sacred song to me. And when I heard that the NFL, with all of its problems, with all of its uh, um, documented uh, racial discrimination, said, well, what we're going to do is during the first, um, first week of opening season, every game will also start with lift every voice and sing. It's like, who needs a song? Well, you know, that's like, that's, that's easy empathy. I'm, when I talk about disruption, I'm talking, I am talking about walking outside of the comfort zone. I am talking about doing something that is, you know, just a little bit different from the things that we normally uh, feel comfortable doing. Thank you. And I, I did have a, another question about, um, you talked about disruptive empathy being moving out of your comfort zone, um, acknowledging hard truths about yourself and not sugarcoating things. What happens when you are talking to someone and they're kind of realizing certain things about themselves and they become defensive? How do you, and I think that may be one reason why too, sometimes people will avoid conflict mm -hmm. because they're afraid that the table will flip and suddenly mm -hmm. you're offering compassion to someone who has flipped the script and made it right. about them and their defensive right. to their right. discomfort. Right. So, so that, I've heard people say, I'm not going to teach anybody. I'm, I'm not going to put myself in that situation where they're going to flip the tables and now I'm giving them comfort. So how do we right. address that? Uh, boy, uh, one of the things that we have to do is know when we're being silenced. And flipping the table, gaslighting, that's one of the ways that we get silenced. So when, again, when I say, I, when I'm talking about empathy, I'm not talking about something that's easy. I'm not talking about everybody feels good and holds hand and, you know, sings Kumbaya and, you know, and says, yeah, yeah, we, 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 we uh, survived another diversity day or whatever. I'm not talking about that at all. I am talking about uh, being able to stand in a relationship, to stand actually and to, 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 to really hear your own voice to hear your own voices, to respectfully put them in relationship. Also, one of the things that I would say is that I am not a person who believes that everybody needs to talk to everybody else. There are some people that, you know, I am, it's certainly not my job to say this person is beyond the pale and you can't talk to them, but it may be that I can't. And it may be a conversation that I don't need to have. And I have to to recognize my own limitations there. Uh, one of the things that happens, and I say this um, with great, with as much respect as I can, is that we can become addicted to our identities. And so when I turn on the television, which is the wrong thing to do just before you go to bed and see the news, and you see a big, beefy, sweaty, muscle-shirted, you know, tattooed man yelling like profanities in the face of a teenager who's holding a sign, that's not a person I'm going to talk to. Because that's like talking to someone, if you've ever tried to have a conversation with someone who is actively drunk, it doesn't go well. So if you're trying to have a conversation with someone who's all in those juices, uh, who's really just coming out of the amygdala, who is coming out of fear, whose the addiction is raging, that's not a conversation I need to have. One of the things I think we need to do when we think about being authentic in these relationships is figure out when to have the conversations. And what makes it a good conversation, have a conversation about the conversation. X happened. I'd like for us to talk about it. This is what it would take for it to be a good conversation for me. What would it take for you? See if we can even have enough common ground to have the conversation. So. I am not in any way suggesting that there's a Pollyanna answer. Uh, we need to be able to recognize all the ways we get silenced. We can get, um, again, I have seen conversations where someone starts crying and all of a sudden, again, that's a flip. You know, the, uh, the, as you, I think you said, the table gets flipped. Or someone starts name calling. Uh, or someone, um, who knew 
that being called, you know, and this I learned from the young people, uh, my grandchildren, uh, being called a social justice warrior is an epithet. That, you know, it's sort of like back in the day being called a bleeding heart liberal. Everybody knew that wasn't, you know, a compliment. Well, now young kids, you know, can get minimized and dismissed by being called social justice warriors. So, I mean, you can get to name calling, gaslighting of any kind. The other thing that, and the other way that it happens, and I think we have to really, really, uh, and I'll be quiet after this so we can get some more questions. Uh, <laughs> uh, we have to really be uh, aware of, and I've, as, right, I'm seeing a lot of this now, is that when you're trying to talk about your experience, whatever it is, and someone demands that you say it's not so, say that you didn't have that experience, then you know that you're, someone is attempting to silence you. You don't have to su succumb to that. How do people do that? Sometimes they demand, well, it could have been, they, you know, um, quick example, a young client of mine who's mixed race heritage was walking down uh, Cambridge Street in late November, 2016, and she had a scarf on. She would have uh, appeared to this man who accosted her to have been from the Middle East. She was not. Uh, but he walked up to her and he started saying what he could do to her and how he could bomb her and you terrorist and just screaming in her face. And she ran to her dorm, talked to her best friend, the person who had been her best friend and probably remained so to say, this is what happened to me. And because it was so hard to hear, her best friend sort of re-injured her by saying, well, you don't know that that's what he really thought. And sometimes when people are drunk, it was all about minimizing her experience and trying to come up with, trying to force her to come up with another story to demand, to explain what happened. So I would always say, know the ways, we have a duty to know all of the ways that people try to silence us when we are trying to move toward healing and reconciliation. Thank you. All right, so we have some questions from our attendees. One question is, in reference to your comment about the NFL, a song is not enough, but isn't something better than nothing? Is it a start? I'm not sure. I mean, I wish I had a great answer for that. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure how the decision was made to do the song. I'm not sure how the decision was made to say, okay, we're going to do it for one week and no more after that because we get it. Uh, I, I, I'm really not at all sure. Again, so many, um, we can get into so many, and, and that's why I think I call it easy empathy. Sometimes it just puts us in some really awkward places that are kind of hard to explain, to defend. I can tell you, uh, of, um, I'm working with a woman now who is one of uh, a very few people of African descent um, in a Western, one of the suburbs in Boston in the school system. And, you know, with everything and was happening in mid June and uh, the funerals were going on, her colleagues with the best of intentions got together and decided that they needed to do something for her. And they sent her a chocolate Carvel ice cream cake to say, we are thinking of you. Now, can we say, is that better than nothing? It, for me, it would have been. I mean, for me, it wouldn't have been. I would prefer nothing. I wouldn't know what to do with that cake, you know, unless I just, you know, like, Okay, Carvel gift cards for everybody because this is not my problem. This is our problem. This is an American problem. What will we do differently when we come back together as colleagues and professionals to train young people? So um, I wish I had a better answer. Someone else might have a comment that they might want to make. Uh, yeah, somebody said that the song can have the unintended consequence of being akin to tokenism. Could be. Mm -hmm. Could be. Uh, you know, I, I can only talk about when, when, when I said that that was my reaction, that is purely my reaction. I'm sure that there are some other people who are just fine with it. Um, I just thought, oh my God, you know, I, uh, uh, in, in my family, you had to know every, st every word to every stanza before you left elementary school, for sure. <laughs> so, so the song is really important to me. 
And I and, and I'm a little I get a little bit nervous when people start like using it to say, okay, see, we're good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. So another question we have is I think the skill of disruptive empathy needs to be learned starting at home and continues into school. Your thoughts? I agree with you. <laughs> it's, it's like most of us, you know, what happens at home is so important. And as parents, and I have to say, I'm so glad to be a grandparent and I don't have to raise young children in this very complex world that they are growing up in now. But I think parents have to be very, very intentional about what we teach because if we just do what comes naturally by default, we just get comfortable. Uh, uh, we teach our children to be comfortable with the way we live. Um, I was talking to young parents, a uh, couple of young parents a few weeks ago, and they said, well, we, we, we want to teach our our, our children to, you know, like fight for racial justice and, you know, we are social justice minded family, but we want it to be organic. And I was thinking to myself, oh my God, you, you live out in the suburbs where I live. How's it going to be organic? You know, you live in the, you know, in the suburbs where there may be, uh, I don't know, uh, 15 hair salons on within a three block area. But when uh, my son was growing up, we had to drive 16 miles into Boston to get a haircut. So there's nothing or, you know, if you, if you do what's organic, you're not going to learn. And the other thing that we have sometimes done, we think, we, things that we, you know, as parents we've done, and sometimes we're just at a cocktail party and need to end the conversation. So we say things like, oh, well, the children will do, you know, the children. It's like, no, the children won't. How will they do it? if we are not teaching them. So I, I really, really want to appreciate that, um, that comment. How will they do it? They learn very early on. Uh, they learn, I have, I'm working with teachers now who, you know, one of the issues they brought to our supervision was uh, a third grader who was having, you know, crying, you know, bouts of crying and anxiety in the classroom, didn't want to go to school. And they found out she had a little classmate sitting behind her saying, your skin is the color of poop. Now, teacher, what should the teacher's response be? Well, the, what the teacher's response in this case was, well, we really need to try to understand what the child meant when he said the color of poop. And I said, no, 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 no. You can't tell me, you can't show me an eight-year-old who does not know that to be called the color of poop is an insult. So we have to stop hiding behind the illusion of childhood innocence and just help children to, um, to have, uh, to be aware of their own thoughts, you know, and, and their age appropriate conversations, you know, for, for all children. You know, one of the things that we know now, it's, it's uh, educators and mental health providers is there's a way to have conversations, but the most damaging thing you can do to a child is not to have the conversations when they see they're feeling everything that's going on, but they don't have language or ways to explain it. So we do have to be quite intentional in classrooms, in kitchens, uh, in, you know, grandma's backyard or wherever we might be with young people. So I think that's a good answer to the question, is it okay to raise my child to be colorblind? Because you just talked about absolutely not. And you just really explained nicely why we can't raise children to be colorblind. So thank you for that. Yeah, I think oftentimes, I mean, it comes again, good intentions, uh, but uh, being colorblind is a way of saying, I have a lot of racial anxiety. Uh, no one can tell me that they can look at me and see a Norwegian male. They see me, they see my body. I show up in a body. And bodies matter. So another question we have is, do you have training sessions for people to learn or discuss your approach to racism? Your expertise is comforting. Your language phrases are empowering. I want to do better. Oh, my heart. <laughs> my heart. I think it's what we all have to do. We come together and we learn. Uh, I, right now, I am um, 
I work with uh, this group we used to be called, and, and some people maybe may know it, but it was the Wellesley College Centers for Women. It was a group, uh, the Dean Baker Miller Training Institute. We are now uh, the Center um, for Growth and Connection. And we do offer trainings, uh, and I often lead um, and participate in, because I, again, I think when, whenever we get together, all of us end up learning something new. And that's, that's why we come together. So uh, through the uh, Center for Growth and Connection, and also just, um, I'm also gonna make the slides available and I hadn't sent them to you yet, but I know uh, we will get them out to people. Uh, and I'm also happy to talk to people, um, just one off, if you would like to email me or with something or a question or uh, we are now, uh, instead of traveling as much as I used to, Renee is teaching me all about Zoom. <laughs> and we're just so happy that we were able to get it to work. <laughs> <laughs> I am happy. <laughs> all right, so let's see, one more question. Let's see. Do you have any recommendations on how to engage people within organs with, excuse me, do you have any recommendations on how to engage people within organizations and inviting them to the table to participate in conversations? Um, oftentimes people will, uh, it, it, it's an act of courage to come out and just say, and this is what I want to do. Uh, I want to have, I want to be in this kind of conversation and actually just saying that to someone and not everyone is going to want to, is going to want to join you. Some people will think they want to join you, but will quickly uh, try and uh, put, send the conversation someplace else. There's a group of people um, in New Orleans called the People's Institute for Survival and Beyond and um, the founders are some of the founding trainers uh, in that organization often talk about what happens when we try to have these conversations about race. We've got to remember that all of us have been through this same school, that all of us have breathed in this ideology that keeps us divided from each other. And it leaves us with a lot of shame, it leaves us with a lot of hostility and a lot of anxiety. So, uh, Sometimes when we invite people into a conversation, we might, you know, um, what people start talking about, well, there's this ism, and then there's that ism, and there's another ism, and it's like, yeah, human beings, we are so inventive in the ways that we hurt and violate each other. But oftentimes when that is happening, as um, uh, Ron Chisholm, one of the founders from People's Institute said, that's all in the service of escapism. So if you want to have these conversations, just be prepared uh, that, you know, it's, uh, it's the kind of process where you need a community and it's best done in community and everybody doesn't have to be alike. We, all we have to do is be in the room wanting to be on a shared journey, knowing that we are experiencing it differently, but we are on this journey that puts us closer and closer to who we can be as whole human beings. Dr. Walker, thank you so much. This was fabulous. It was beyond my expectations. I learned so much. I was taking notes. Um, you introduced terms to me that I never really heard of or really put thought into. Um, thank you so much. And thank you to everyone who was able to join us today. As I mentioned earlier, I have recorded this presentation. It will be available on our website. Dr. Walker has been kind enough to share with her, us her PowerPoint presentation. That will be online as well. I will email everyone who registered for this event when everything's available on our website. So thank you so much. Have a nice day. Thank you, Dr. Walker. Don't leave. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for coming, for our coming together. <laughs>